Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Okay, hello and welcome, automotive world, to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I will be your host today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I greatly appreciate it. I'm glad everyone's here. Today on the show, we are going to talk about something that can be uh, extremely frustrating in the automotive world. And that topic is when we have a part, a new part, uh, quote, new part, um, that we've installed on a vehicle to repair a problem, to fix something that we have diagnosed. And that new part, that brand new part out of the box is failed, is bad right out of the box. So we put it on the car and it either (laughs) presents the same symptoms as the part we just took off that we diagnosed as failed or presents completely different symptoms. Um, that we didn't even have before, but this is a new part that we just purchased from the parts store, the dealership, a remanufacturer, wherever it might be from, but it is a new part. This should work. And this can be one of the most difficult things, especially when we're diagnosing problems on a vehicle, especially when we're learning and maybe we haven't seen this problem before. Maybe this is, you know, a unique issue with a vehicle and we put this part on the car and, you know, sometimes we do all of our research. We do all of the tests. We do everything the best that we can as technicians and diagnosticians, but you know, sometimes you just got to make that call on something. Okay. I've done everything I possibly can. I am 99% sure this part is going to take care of it, but heck, there's always variables. Let's get this thing on there and see what happens. And then the same problems there, or maybe even a different problem. And now you second guess everything that you did. What did I do wrong? Obviously that part didn't fix the problem. I need to go back through all my testing steps and figure out what I missed when really it's no fault of your own. Now, in an ideal world, your tests, your diagnostic procedure should instill enough confidence in you that you know that you made the right call. But anybody that's done this for any amount of time knows how these cars can humble you and you can make a bad call and you can miss something. And that's the thing I think of immediately when this happens to me. You know, what did I miss? And a lot of times we're very hesitant to blame that new part that we just put in, especially if it's the same problem. That can be really, really tricky because you don't feel like you fixed anything at all. So what I'm going to do today, um, I'll just talk a little bit about that topic, about how new parts can be failed and we don't want to forget about it. And then I'm going to take you through a case study that I went through recently on a 2007 Dodge Nitro that really highlights this aspect of automotive repair uh, more so than anything I've dealt with uh, in recent memory. And it's a great case study too. The problems that I encountered were pretty interesting and relevant to a lot of different uh, Chrysler vehicles. So some interesting things to go along with uh, highlighting the fact that just because the part is new doesn't mean that it's a good working part. Um, You might notice my voice is a little funny today. I'm not sick, thankfully. I just strained my voice this weekend. Uh, Maybe just talking more than I'm used to. I'm really not too sure, but uh, it's a little bit of a deeper tone, I feel like. Who knows? Maybe that's a good thing. But just in case anybody's wondering why I sound a little different. Anyways... Just to introduce us into this, uh, if you've never had this happen to you where you put on a brand new part on a vehicle and it's failed, it's not working properly right out of the box, it probably will happen to you at some point or another, especially if you're buying aftermarket or remanufactured parts. That's where it's most likely to happen, Uh, you know, like a remanufactured engine or transmission. Boy, (laughs) there's a good chance you're going to get something that doesn't work properly when you put it together. 
And again, you second guess yourself at that point, you know, did I make the right call? Um, but even new parts and even parts from the dealership, okay, this is the the factory part that came on that vehicle when it came down the assembly line, those can be failed. And I've had that happen to me before. So just to illustrate a couple examples uh, in my memory that I try to, I try to remember this while I'm out diagnosing things, because again, you, you tend to stray away from that new part that's on there. Cause well, that shouldn't be bad. It's, it's new. It should work properly. And even if it doesn't work properly, what are the odds that it's going to create the same problem that I just had? Uh, it's unlikely, but possible. And we don't want to forget that because we can waste a lot of time second guessing ourselves and going back through the testing procedures, looking for something that's not there. When we know what the problem is, we made the right call. And it's not to say that hey, we don't make bad calls. I, I, I do that <laughs> from time to time. Um, but this is just something you want to have in your mind. And again, these are some examples that help me keep this top of mind when I'm getting into uh, diagnostics, especially when I'm going to other shops. Because a lot of times when I go into a shop, they've already replaced parts. And a lot of times they replace the wrong part, but there's a good portion of the time where they replace the correct part. They put in the part that was failed. They made their diagnosis correct, but that new part or that remanufactured part that they put in is also failed. And then at that point, they don't know what to do, that they're second guessing themselves. They're assuming, you know, uh, must need a computer or uh, you know, maybe the computer is what was replaced. And now I have to go in and prove that that new part has failed. And maybe that's a little easier uh, when I come in after uh, the initial diagnosis, because I can take in the big picture. But man, when you're in it, when you're in the weeds and you were the one that, you know, made that call on that part, uh, that can be challenging to see past it when it's doing the same thing as it did before. Anyways, just a couple quick examples, and then we'll get into the main case study here. Uh, one of the earliest times that this happened to me was on a Dodge Avenger. And I don't exactly remember the year, um, mid 2000s, had 2.4 liter uh, dual overhead cam, four cylinder, setting crankshaft sensor codes. Okay. Now, Chrysler, if you're not familiar, has a history of cam and crank sensor problems where uh, problems are created with aftermarket sensors. Okay, so an aftermarket sensor is put in and it does not function the way that the factory sensor normally would. So the fix on a lot of these Chrysler vehicles with crank sensor problems is to make sure that you get a Chrysler sensor in there. And at this point in my career, this was earlier in my career, but I still knew this. I knew that the factory was the way to go. We want an OEM part. We want it from Chrysler. We want that Mopar part to put in there. And that's what I told my service writer. I was like, get me a factory sensor. Uh, Cause when I worked at Firestone, I dealt with this a lot. You get aftermarket parts that just don't work right out of the box. Um, you know, the cheap stuff that you get from the Napa, O'Reilly's, and AutoZone. And nothing against them, but they are in such competition over price, especially nowadays with things like Amazon, they have to have an option for the cheapest part possible. Well, guess what you get with the cheapest part possible? Stuff that doesn't work. It's not engineered to the standards of what needs to be in that vehicle. So anyways, I'm aware of this at this point. I've experienced it. But I told them, get me a sensor from Chrysler. They get me a sensor from Chrysler. I put it in, still have crankshaft sensor codes. And I really struggled on this one because I assumed, okay, it's got a brand new Chrysler sensor in it. That's obviously not the problem. I'm dealing with something else. So I go through the wiring. I don't find any issues. I overlaid the wires anyways, uh, which is running a brand new set of these three wires from the PCM to the crankshaft sensor. Still the same thing. We call in a mobile technician because again, this was early in my career. I didn't even have a scope at this point. Uh, we called in a mobile flashing surface to reprogram the PCM because I thought, well, maybe an update on this PCM would be the problem. And they did that and that didn't fix it. And so, you know, I've really lost at this point. Now I'm thinking, well, maybe we need to replace the PCM um, it going off in all kinds of different directions. Again, I don't, I don't have a scope at this point, uh, just relying on what I have with a 
a scan tool and a voltmeter. Um, and one of the other technicians said, just try another crank sensor. And so what we ended up doing was we got a crank sensor from AutoZone, we put it in and that worked. And so, um, whatever that means about who makes these crankshaft sensors who knows maybe they all come from the same place but the one from the factory was was bad it was bad right out of the box a brand new part from the chrysler dealership was causing the same codes as the failed sensor and an auto zone one that we put in there fixed it i remember how frustrating that was to and i spent hours and hours on this car and i was just i was so I don't know, lost to that point because I'm like, well, what can I trust? I can't trust brand new parts from the dealership. <laughs> what what do I trust? Um, that's why this can be so frustrating and make us waste so much time and kind of why I wanted to talk about it today. Um, another one, this was just this past week that I ran into. It was a uh, Chrysler 200, so a very similar vehicle. And I guess we're going to be talking a lot about Chryslers today. Um this had a crankshaft sensor replaced. It was a AutoZone or a Riley's uh, crankshaft sensor, the, you know, the, just the cheap bottom dollar one that you can get from those parts stores. A customer installed that, brought it to the shop because it didn't fix whatever problem they were having. The shop couldn't diagnose it or they weren't sure which direction to go. They were actually suggesting a PCM update as well. I got into it. I looked at it and found that that crankshaft sensor was failed. And I told them, you know, get an OEM crankshaft sensor, but who knows, you're still rolling the dice, but they got an OEM crankshaft sensor and uh, that ended up taking care of it. And it's a little bit easier to tell with scope patterns uh, if those crankshaft sensor signals are correct. It makes it an easier call. Um, again, when I'm coming into it secondhand, it's also easy to make that call because I didn't make the initial diagnosis. It's not my, uh, you know, call that is suspect here. I'm coming in as a second opinion. Anyways, similar situation, but reversed. The AutoZone or O'Reilly sensor was bad right out of the box. And maybe I shouldn't even say bad. I bet you the sensor functioned the way it was designed, but it wasn't designed to work properly with that computer, with that engine. And the computer's looking for something specific on a lot of these sensors. Uh, speed and position sensors, especially for engine speed, is a big deal. Um, we talked about the Chevy Cruze and how the auto start and non-auto start crankshaft sensors are different. And that can cause uh, all kinds of crazy issues. If you haven't listened to that episode, uh, check out the uh, the case study about the Chevy Cruze uh, with no power steering. Um, another one that really sticks in my head, and this one was weird. Okay. So I had a GM with a 3,800 engine, very common engine. I had a misfire on a cylinder, low compression, pretty easy to spot. We ended up put, doing a leak down test. We found it was a valve that was leaking. Okay. We had a pressure that was escaping past the valve seat, pretty easy slam dunk call. Let's put a head on it. And I'm actually the one that put a head on this vehicle. I was you know, working as a full-time repair technician at the time. So we put a cylinder head on this vehicle and we get it all back together and start it up. And I still have a misfire on the same cylinder. Well, what the heck? What did I forget? I mess up the spark plug, forget to plug in the injector, all that stuff checks out. I get back to my compression test. Okay. I have low compression on that same cylinder. I'm like, oh boy, did I miss something? Are the rings bad, pissed in? What's, what's happening here? Did I mess something up on reassembly? We go through it again. I do the leak down test again, and it is leaking on the same cylinder and it is leaking on the same valve. Okay. This is a uh, completely uh, rebuilt cylinder head. Uh, nor, a lot of times we'd send the cylinder heads out, they would get rebuilt and sent back to us. In this case, it's a, such a common engine that they had a cylinder head that was already rebuilt, ready to go on the shelf. We sent ours in as a core. They sent us this one. We bolted on. But what are the odds that the same valve on the same cylinder had leakage? And maybe it goes to show a failure, a common failure with that engine. But you expect if somebody is going to the trouble of rebuilding these cylinder heads, that they would actually do some pressure checks and check these things to make sure that they actually fixed what was wrong. And um, I just remember thinking, 
when when you're in that moment, you've done a lot of work to put a cylinder head on a car. You went through the work of diagnosing it. Your service writer gave the customer this big estimate. I mean, we're, we're spending over $1,000 here and the thing's got a misfire and it ends up being low compression. You're like, oh boy, what did I miss? We're going to have to put an engine in this thing. You know, it's lower end. Um, it's just such a crappy feeling. And then to go back through it and you're second guessing yourself and you're frustrated. It is, it is rough. And like I said, yeah, we do make bad calls. It, it happens. We're all human. Anybody says that they don't is lying or hasn't done that many actual uh, diagnosis, uh, hasn't actually diagnosed that many vehicles in the real world. It's, it's just part of our job. But when it happens, no fault of your own, uh, that's when this can be frustrating because we end up wasting time going back through everything. And then you're going to have to replace something again. Hopefully as a technician, you're getting paid for that, um, you know, or as a diagnostician, you're getting paid for your time, but a frustrating situation nonetheless. So with that being said, you get where I'm coming from. And I'm sure most of you have experienced something like this at some point in time. But our case study today, again, really highlights some of these things that I've been talking about. And this is going to be on a 2007 Dodge Nitro RT. Ooh, it's the fast one with a 4.0 liter single overhead cam V6. All right. Um, here are the symptoms. Shop calls me in to come take a look at this thing. Uh, this thing runs rough. Okay. Idles uh, very, uh, very rough. It actually will stall out. Uh, feels like it might be misfiring. They're not sure. The check engine light is on and they've had multiple parts replaced and this vehicle has been to multiple shops. So I, this was either the second or the third shop uh, that this vehicle had been at uh, in order to remedy the concerns that it's having. And they're struggling through it and they're not sure which direction to go. Um, they actually were thinking that it was probably a computer issue because that was one of the things that had not been replaced is the PCM. And that's where I get called in a lot because um, they know that I do flashing. And so they'll say, well, is there maybe an update for something like this? And every once in a while there is. In this case, it was definitely uh, not an update or even a computer that was going to fix this problem. But as far as parts that I could see that were replaced, they had replaced all four oxygen sensors. Uh, you know, why they did the downstreams, not 100% sure, but all four oxygen sensors are brand new shiny Bosch O2 sensors. Looks like they had just been put in. All the coils had been replaced, the ignition coils, and they told me the spark plugs were new as well. And I did ask on what style of plug that they used and they did use the champion spark plugs oh they had also mentioned that uh, they had disassembled the top end of the engine and uh, i think they had just pulled the valve covers to look to see if there was any uh, rocker arm damage or valve spring damage or anything like that and they didn't find anything so they had reassembled it at this point when i came in the engine was completely back together um, everything was installed so at this point, they're not really sure what direction to go with it. So I get in, I confirm that it is running very rough. Um, it actually seems to run okay right away when you first fire it up. Not great, but it runs okay. And then as it warms up, it seems to get worse. Uh, it seems to get rougher and uh, misfire. The misfire was seemed to be constant, but it, it again, it got worse as it as it warmed up. So it's something I want to consider. And uh, it does play a role with what we ended up finding here. I also noticed that after it'd been running for a while, it really kind of stunk that sulfur rich smell. So I'm, I'm thinking about an air fuel mixture uh, issue here. But the first thing that I want to do is hook up to this thing and see you know, what do we got for codes? Because we got to check engine light on. So I hook up the Autel. I pull codes out of this thing. Here's the codes that I have. Uh, number one, I have a P0303, which is a misfire on cylinder number three. Okay, that's awesome. I have a direction to go there, um, but let's look at the other codes too to see what else we have. Because of course, you know, other things could be causing a misfire. We want to get the whole picture before we decide, uh, you know, where are we going to jump to? What are we going to look at? So the other four codes that I have, and I'm going to list these off quick. Don't worry so much about the number. So I'll explain what they are after. I have a P0132, P0138, 
a P0152 and a P0158, okay? Don't worry so much about those numbers. You may be familiar with them. You may have seen those before. Those are O2 sensor circuit high codes, all right? So our O2 sensor has four wires, two for the heater, two for the sensor portion. These codes are indicating that the sensor portion, the signal wire from those O2 sensors are indicating a higher voltage than the computer expects. And I have those set on all four oxygen sensors. So I took a look at the freeze frame information on there. Uh, you always wanna do that before clearing codes, but I wanted to see were these circuit codes set when they replaced the sensors possibly? Is this why they put sensors in there? Um, I think it was, but I wanna see are these hard faults? Is it, are these O2 sensor codes going to set right away? Usually what I'll do with this is snapshot uh, some of the freeze frame data and the codes with the autel in case I need to come back to that information. And we always have to consider this. If we're going to clear codes, we need to uh, consider what else we're changing. You know, maybe adaptive strategies, obviously the freeze frame data that goes along with it. This can be very valuable information. We don't want to lose it. We want to look at it. So I'll save it as a snapshot, a screenshot in my tablet. So just in case maybe I can't recreate this problem or I need to know something about when it was set, I can go back to it. But my goal here to see is do these codes set immediately? Is this something I need to chase right now or was it created while they're doing the work? And I, I run into this a lot. I come into a vehicle and there's all kinds of codes set. Only some of them are the hard faults, the issues that I need to chase. The other codes have been created while a diagnosis was attempted and things were unplugged and parts were changed. And we use set code sometimes if the key's on while we're doing that sort of stuff. So anyways, I clear the codes out of there. And after a very short period of running, maybe a minute, uh, maybe even less than that, all four of these O2 sensors codes come back. Uh, now the misfire code did come back as well, although that took a little longer, but I'm going to kind of put that off to the side for the moment. Uh, the misfire was important, but I want to focus on these O2 sensor codes because uh, I did mention that it seemed to run okay at first and then it got worse as it warmed up. That's an indication that it can kind of run in open loop, but once it gets to the closed loop portion of things, or I guess at least attempted closed loop, uh, it's not working as well. I want to take a look at what my sensor voltages actually look like on the scan tool. You know, what's happening on these oxygen sensors. And again, the circuit codes set. It's saying that the sensor signal wire has a higher voltage than is expected by the computer at a given point. That's what all four of these codes mean. They're just for all four of the O2 sensors, okay? And I, I got to think in my head, what could affect all four O2 sensors? And there, there are possibilities. But before I get there, I want to talk a little bit about how Chrysler in particular monitors their O2 sensors for activity because it's a little bit different than a lot of other makes and models. All right, so here is what Chrysler does. Okay, so again, we have four wires going to our O2 sensor. Two wires are for a heater, power and ground for a heater, and we'll get to those. But the other two wires are for the sensor portion. And the sensor, if you're not familiar, in a narrow band oxygen sensor is going to produce a voltage uh, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.9, somewhere in that range, depending on the air fuel mixture within the exhaust. That's the idea behind an O2 sensor. And those two wires, one of them is a signal wire. That signal wire is basically where the O2 sensor is pushing voltage out to the PCM for it to read. And the other wires are ground uh, for the actual sensor portion. So, um, and that's just basic O2 sensor operation. That's how all narrowband sensors are going to operate. And well, to be totally honest, there is uh, a lot of technical um, information that goes into how an O2 sensor operates. We're not going to get into that here. Maybe that's a topic for another day uh, with somebody who's uh, really smart with that stuff. But just as a basic understanding, uh, the O2 sensor is going to produce a small amount of voltage. All right. And on that signal wire, uh, when, a, when an O2 sensor is heated up, okay, when it's hot, we expect to see at least 
uh, you know, 0.1, uh, 100 millivolts or 0.1 volt, a tenth of a volt on that, on, on the lean side of things and 0.9 on the rich side of things. But before these sensors actually heat up and start working because they have to be hot to work, that is the only way that action sensors are going to produce this voltage is if they're hot. Uh, zirconium dioxide uh, the material that's used as an electrolyte in these sensors only works, only performs its job when it is above a certain temperature. And if we go into um, the wideband O2 sensors, that temperature goes up even higher. I want to say it's around 600 some degrees for a narrow band, the kind of sensor we're talking about, and then over a thousand for a wide band. Again, we're not talking about wide bands, probably a discussion for another episode, maybe. Um, but again, they got to be hot to work. That's the point of this. And before they're hot, if we were to look at the two wires going to the sensor portion, the signal wire, and the ground wire, it's basically an open circuit between those two wires. If you're looking at the O2 sensor, you would take, a, you would take an ohm meter at the O2 sensor cold and you put one lead on the signal side and one lead on the ground side at the sensor, you would measure an open or an extremely high resistance. And that's just how it is. There's no conductivity at that point. Well, as it warms up, it becomes uh, a circuit, if you will. It starts producing a voltage and that can be seen on the, on the signal wire. Well, here's what Chrysler does. They kind of treat this like a thermistor almost. What they do is they output a 5-volt bias on the signal wire. Okay, So normally, if we think about our O2 sensor working, there's a voltage that's getting pumped out from our oxygen sensor to the PCM. PCM reads it, determines what the air-fuel mixture is in the exhaust. But during startup, after you hit that key and you fire this thing up, Chrysler sends a 5-volt bias out to the sensor and it is going to wait and see if this 5 volt bias gets pulled to a ground all right so there is a fixed resistor within the pcm um, that this 5 volt bias runs through and this fixed resistor is a very very high resistance and what happens is once that sensor starts producing voltage uh, once it kind of becomes a circuit is actually going to pull that 5 volt bias down uh, by a significant amount. And the computer expects to see that. So the computer is watching this signal wire and it sees 5 volts when the sensor's cold. And once the sensor is heated up and doing something, it's going to drop down from that 5 volts. That's the expectation. All right. And it's watching to see that. And if it, know, it knows if that does not happen, it's going to set these circuit high codes. That's where we get these O2 sensor signal high because it's seeing five volts all the time. After a set amount of time that we expect this thing to be hot, we expect it to pull that five volt bias down uh, to something else. It's not doing that. We're still seeing five volts. Why why is that? Um, and that's what the code's for. That's what we need to figure out. So I verify this on my scan tool because these codes are setting pretty consistently. And I look at the raw data for the signal wires on the O2 sensors. And there's a little bit more to Chrysler O2s as far as other bias voltages go. But for now, just focus on we're not dropping our 5 volts. I'm looking at the data PIDs on the scan tool all of these O2 sensors are reading uh, somewhere around 4.8 or 4.9 volts. And that is after this thing has been warmed up, it's hot, you know, the exhaust is hot to the touch, the engine is operating temperature. The O2s should be hot at this point. And they should be hot enough to pull that 5-volt bias down to kind of complete the circuit. Um, it's basically an open circuit is what it's saying. Okay, so why is this? Do I actually have an open circuit to all of these oxygen sensors? I guess it's possible, but, you know, unlikely. Is this a computer issue? Uh, what's going on here? Well, we do need to consider, again, that these O2 sensors have to be hot to work. Now, you would think they're in the exhaust, okay? Wouldn't they be hot? Well, the other side of these O2 sensors that I mentioned is the heater portion, and in you know 96 when they first started coming out with heated oxygen sensors because they didn't used to be they used to just be a signal wire and then maybe a ground wire a lot of them grounded through the exhaust they'd place these things really close to the engine 
okay? And they'd still take a while to get hot, but they would get hot enough just because they're like in the exhaust manifold. They're right there at the hottest part of the exhaust that heat these sensors up enough to produce a voltage. Well, they added these heaters and a lot of the heaters were there because we've got downstream sensors that are after the cats, far away from the engine, and the exhaust just doesn't get hot enough to get the O2 sensor hot enough to function. All right, so we put heaters in basically. We send power and ground to these heaters that are built into the sensors and that is going to get those sensors up to the proper temperature to operate even if the sensor is located uh, you know, a significant distance away from the engine. And it gives us flexibility on where we can put these sensors. We don't have to jam them up right next to the engine. We can move them when, well, not us, but the engineers can put them wherever it makes sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense <laughs> if you're trying to replace one, but that is going to allow us to heat up that sensor to operating temperature no matter where it's at. But that's a key thing to remember. If that heater doesn't work, that O2 sensor is not going to get hot enough to function. So I have to consider this with everything that I'm thinking about. Okay, I got four O2 sensors that don't seem to be doing anything, that seem to just be open circuit. And remember, all four O2 sensors are replaced. These are brand new. So um, what could affect all four O2 sensors? That's again what I'm coming back to. This isn't just one circuit that's having this issue. This is all four. Uh, I take a look at the sensors and what I'm thinking is, is there a heater issue that could affect all of these? And I look at the circuit and it looks like the ground is shared uh, for all of these uh, sensors. But let's just pick the easiest one to get to. And basically, I want to make sure the heater's working, okay? Because if the heater's working and these sensors are getting hot, uh, they should be pulling down that 5-volt bias. You know, for some reason, they're not. Maybe there is maybe there is a circuit issue, but let's eliminate the heater as a possibility. So that's where I ended up going first on these. And again, I have no heater codes in this. Uh, there are heater circuit codes that would set. But still, I'm going to verify it's working. And I, I do have you know, some reasoning behind this as well, uh, which I'll get to uh, because I've run into this before. Uh, so first thing, I check the ground first because in this circuit, uh, the ground is constant to these heaters and it is a high side switched, meaning that the PCM is going to pulse with modulate a power source, a B plus 12 volts to the heaters to get them to activate. And that is actually something that is important to remember is that it is a pulse with modulated power source to these heaters to get them to operate constant ground. So again, I'm picking my easiest sensor I can get to. I'm going to start with one since they all have the same issue. I assume uh, maybe if I find it on one, I'll find the problem for all of them. Well, I check again. I have the ground and you want to load this ground because a uh, heater is an output. All right, this is a component that is going to draw some current and we want to make sure that the wire, the circuit is capable of handling that current. And so we're going to load this down. And so I'm going to use a headlight bulb for this um, and it's not running through a computer. It's not running through a uh, the PCM. Again, this is grounded on the backside of the block. Um, so I'm not worried about the amount of current that flows through this wire and uh, you know, you could pull four or five amps with one of these uh, 9,000 series headlight bulbs, but that's good for me. I know that I have a good solid connection at that point. Well, it lights up. It looks great. Okay, good ground. So now I need to check my power and this is where you want to be careful. You don't want to just start using headlight bulbs on this side of the circuit because this power is provided by a transistor, which is inside the PCM. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave the O2 sensor plugged in. And what I want to do is take my U-scope out and I am going to back probe on the control side, the power side of this heater. And I just want to see what's going on. And I could also use an amp clamp if I wanted to. I could put an amp clamp, but I just want to see voltage wise, does the computer have control over this heater? And what I see uh, when I start this thing up and I have my U-scope hooked up, is that it, it's a very strange looking signal. If you've ever seen a pulse width modulated signal, it's very repetitive. So 0 to 12, 0 to 12, and it is a square wave. And this wasn't quite it. It did not look right. So something was going on on the control side of this thing. So I want to check and see, is this consistent? Is this on every single one of these oxygen sensor heaters is 
they're a PCM problem. What's going on here? So I move over to the next oxygen sensor. I do the same thing. You know, I've got this thing running. The heater should be operating. I back probe on the power side, the control side of the heater. And again, the signal just looks weird. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to post a video of this signal so you can see what I'm talking about. So check out the Facebook group, Automotive Diagnostic Podcast, and you can see this video of the control side on this, this heater. And what I ended up finding was if I added my test light in parallel. So really what I'm doing here is I'm back probed into the heater circuit for just, we'll, we'll stick with one oxygen sensor here. And I wanted to see, is this thing going to light my test light? You know, the headlight bulb was a little riskier on a, on a computer controlled circuit, but I know my test light draws less amperage than a, a heater for an oxygen sensor. You know, heater for an oxygen sensor, you were thinking around an amp a lot of times, depending on the application. Um, a test light's going to be 300 milliamps, but I just want to see, can I get my test light to light from this thing? And disconnected, um, when I just unplugged the connector for the O2 sensor, uh, it wasn't lighting my test light. But what I found was if I leave the O2 sensor plugged in, okay, so the connector's there. I back probe the heater control side and I touch my test light to that back probe and my test light is grounded. Um, I'm adding that test light bulb in parallel to the O2 sensor heater. And what would happen at that point is my test light would light and I looked at the pattern on the scope and it actually turned into a normal pulse width modulated signal that I would expect to see. And I will show this video. You're going to see in the video me not connected with my test light and my test light connected to that circuit. So what's going on here? Okay, if I'm adding my test light in series here, um, it's able to somehow provide the correct signal so the computer is capable uh, is this a circuit issue uh, is it an issue with a new part and i've actually been down this road before and i have to give credit to paul danner scanner danner and i will put a link in the show notes to the video he has about this issue because this is a known issue and if you work on these chryslers you do need to know about this what's happening here is the transistors, the drivers for these O2 sensor heaters are not meant to operate without the correct heater in place. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, if we're thinking about current draw, we're thinking about resistance of the circuit, there is a specific resistance that these heaters are meant to operate with. And there's a certain current draw that these drivers are meant to operate with. And if you buy the Bosch style sensor, which these had in it, and Bosch makes a lot of O2 sensors and they're not all bad, but for this application, the Bosch O2 style heater is meant to be on full time, 100%, okay, um, 12 volt ground all the time. That's how these heaters are meant to actually work, to turn on and to operate. And the resistance reflects that, that that's how these heaters are designed. Well, the O2 sensors that came with this car, when it came off of the factory assembly line, the O2 sensors were meant to be pulse width modulated, just like I told you these were. And so the actual heater element is designed differently. Okay, If you're designing an electronic component to be either 100% on or off or pulse width modulated, it's probably going to be designed differently. These ones, it, it is. And when you put in the wrong O2 sensor, even though it bolts up, even though it plugs in, even though the parts catalog says it's right for the vehicle, it is not going to function properly. These O2 sensors are not going to heat up because the heater essentially isn't doing anything. Uh, what I did was I actually just sent power straight to this O2 sensor and I let it get hot enough and it started working. It started producing a signal. It dropped that five volt bias. So I know the problem is in the sensor and it has to do with the heater circuit. I'm surprised there were no heater circuit codes. Maybe if I had driven this thing longer, there would be, but I know that's where my issue is and a little bit of experience. And again, credit to Paul Danner and his video, cause I've seen it and I will put the link in the show notes. If you want to know more about this issue, cause this is a known issue with these Chryslers, watch his video and there is a specific brand of O2 sensor that is used from the factory that you can get after market, but you need to know what it is. And I'm going to leave that to his video. 
you are interested in knowing what type of O2 sensor do I need for these mid-2000s Chryslers with this issue where you can get the wrong aftermarket O2 sensor, um, watch his video. Uh, it's great stuff and explains it in great detail. Um, but there's a specific brand that you need to buy. The heater is meant to be pulse width modulated. So bottom line is, long story short here, on the O2 sensor circuit codes, all four O2 sensors need to be replaced. Okay, so they were replaced, they're brand new, but they're the wrong ones for the vehicle. A new part that does not work correctly for the vehicle. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's right for the vehicle or that it's going to work correctly. So that's my first challenge. Uh, I tell them, okay, we're going to have to do all 402 sensors. But before I leave, I want to just examine this misfire a little bit because I'm not totally convinced that uh, dead miss, which is what this kind of felt like, is completely caused by some O2 sensors. Could be, but I want to just verify that there's not anything else going on. And I did a relative compression test, intake pulse test, looks great, mechanical. Okay, good. Let's rule that out because uh, we don't want to have them put in four new O2 sensors and have, you know, a bad piston or something. So that all looks good. And so I'm just going to do some quick checks on the injector and I'm going to do some quick checks on the coil. And what I ended up finding with the scope was that the number three coil uh, was not firing properly. And again, this is a brand new ignition coil that they had put in. So they had a little trouble believing me on this because I'm telling them, hey, those 402 sensors are in there. They're brand new. You got to replace those. <laughs> with And that new coil that's in there, uh, you got to replace that as well. And you got to pull the intake off of this. So I don't know if you want to put in a, new, a different plug at the same time, uh, go for it. But uh, it looks like the coil from what I could see on my scope uh, through a secondary waveform. I was using the Pico and the coil wand. So anyways, I tell them at this point, okay, do this stuff. I don't know if this is going to solve all your issues because this was all man-made. These were all parts that were put into this thing. Was there an underlying issue beyond all this stuff or did they fix something along the way and create new problems? And I told them I don't really know at this point, but we got to get this thing in closed loop and have uh, fuel trims and not have a misfire before I can really go any further with it. And there's really not a whole lot else I can tell. I've identified what issues I can, but... You know, when there's multiple issues, let's let's move some steps forward and then we can decide where to go. So they do this and they, they get the correct O2 sensors in there and they put a coil in there and they call me and say, hey, this thing's running significantly better. Uh, we don't have that rich smell out of the exhaust. The O2 sensor codes are gone. We have fuel trims that we can use. The O2 sensors are reading correctly, um, but and the, the misfire has gone. But what this thing does is it stalls intermittently at idle, okay? And it was stalling before. They're not sure if it's the same. But anyways, they want me to come and kind of finish up with it. And I feel more comfortable at this point. You know, we've established a little bit of a stronger running engine, more stability. Okay, what is the, what is the stalling issue? What's causing this to stall? So I get there and this thing stalls randomly at idle. It's not consistent, uh, but it's consistent enough where at least I can catch it. It's not, um, you know, it doesn't take an hour to do it, but I'd say every few minutes, this thing would just, it would just stall out at idle. I didn't drive it, but revving it up, accelerating the engine, couldn't get to stall, but it did stall at idle. Um, when you have something like this, and there weren't any codes setting uh, for this, and anytime it would stall, all of our codes were gone. And again, misfire is gone, O2 sensors are working. Uh, not setting any code. So at this point, what we need to ask ourselves is what are we missing? Uh, when you have an engine that shuts off, that stalls, that stops running, you're missing one of three major categories for a short period of time. And that's either going to be air, fuel, or spark. All right. And it, when it really boils down to it, those are, as Jim Morton says, the funnels that we need to decide which one are we going down. So those are our initial checks, what we need to do to figure out why is this thing stalling? What are we missing? Ask yourself that when an engine either doesn't start or stalls or even a misfire. You can go, you can use the same funnel theory. Is it air, fuel, or spark? Now there's a lot of possibilities once you get into a funnel, but we got to pick our funnel. We got to decide which path are we going to go um, to figure out what's going on with this stalling. So for this, and I should mention this thing starts right back up after it stalls. So this is a very quick intermittent issue and it's going to be tough to catch. Uh, this isn't just like an engine that's not starting. 
or a dead hole. This is just a quick blip, it's done, then it restarts. So we're gonna use our scope and this is where scope can really shine because it can slow time down for us. These are events that are happening so fast on a running engine and a four stroke cycle that we just don't even have the capability to perceive it um, without these tools like a scope. And this is just one area where Gosh, you got to have a scope if you're going to accurately diagnose some of this stuff. So I pull out the Pico, four channels. Here's what I'm going to look at on this vehicle. I want to look at the cam and crank signals, okay? And that is really only because I know there's a lot of issues with cam and crank sensors on these vehicles, on these Chrysler vehicles, and could definitely cause the vehicle to stall. So I want to look at those. Those are two of my channels. The other two that I'm going to look at, the um, amperage, and I got a couple amp clamps. So I'm going to look at the amperage for the coils, and then I'm also going to look at the amperage for fuel injectors as well. So I've got, and I'm going to use the, the fuses and the circuits to the best of my ability so that I can see all of this at one time. So what I'm saying is I want to see all six injector events. I want to see all six coil events, and then I want to see the cam and crank. And when this happens, I want to see what I'm missing. You know, if I don't lose anything, then maybe I'll look towards air. This is an electric throttle. Maybe something's going on there, but it just seems to be idling fine. And then it's done. There's, there's no stumble. There's nothing like that. Um, but let's, let's see what happens. And so I do this, I get everything hooked up. And when this stalls, my cam and crank sensors look okay. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of a glitch in the crank sensor. Um, and I'm actually going to show, I'm going to share these scope captures with you on the website and on the Facebook group. So if you wanted to right now, you could pause this podcast, pull up the scope captures, and it'll make a little bit more sense as to what I'm explaining, but I will do the best I can with audio to explain what I saw in these scope captures. So again, cam, crank, injector, and coils. Cam and crank look okay. Again, not perfect on the crank. There's a little bit of a glitch there, actually. And so I'm thinking, okay, maybe a crank sensor. But what happens is I lose both injector and coil control when this happens. And every once in a while, the engine will kind of catch itself and keep running. I noticed there'd be like kind of a glitch and then it would actually pick itself up before it stalled. And then sometimes it would actually completely stall. Um, but no matter what, whenever it happened, I lose injector control and I lose coil control. So really the computer's not <laughs> commanding the injectors to fire. It's not commanding the uh, coils to fire. So of course, we're not going to have a running engine. It's going to stall, obviously. So there's this glitch that I'm seeing in the crankshaft sensor. The problem is, is, is that causing what I'm seeing? Definitely possible. Again, we see crankshaft sensor issues with these a lot. Um, but I was taking a look at the scope capture, and I mentioned that I had the ignition amperage up as well, and I saw something really funny with the waveform. Uh, if you think of the waveform, and I'm, I'm looking at current, I'm looking at amperage of the ignition coil, um, the way it should look normally is... A, a slow ramp upwards. If you think of a ski hill, that's kind of how it looks. If you see a straight shot up, uh, that's a shorted coil. That's going to be an issue. That's going to be a misfire, and I don't really have that right now. But at the top, when the coil actually shuts off, you see a sharp drop down to zero. And there's no current, and that's when the spark actually happens. On this, I have something really weird. Every time, right before this thing stalls, I have a, a, a small dip at the peak in the current in the coil that I'm looking at. And I wonder to myself, because I, I had captured it a couple times, two, three times, I had this happen and it was the same thing. And I'm wondering, is this stalling at the same coil every single time? And what I mean by that is where we have six coils on this engine. Is this thing stalling out when a specific coil fires? Because the glitch in the crank sensor and the dropout in control happens immediately after coil firing every time. So I want to know, is this the same coil? So I compare several different events and I use not only the crank sensor, but the cam sensor 
to indicate to me that yes, this is the same coil every single time that this engine stalls. And I use utilize the firing order and I use a sync um, on the, uh, I think it was the number three coil I had it on. Uh, don't quote me on that. Anyways, I use a sync and I use the firing order to figure out that this is the number five coil. Okay, so cylinder number five, it's the back one on the passenger side. Every single time this thing stalls, it is immediately after the number five coil fires. And there's some weird stuff going on in these patterns. You'll have to take a look at them to see what I'm talking about. I will illustrate that in the pictures. But what's happening here? Why would an engine stall? Why would a PCM drop out control after a specific coil fires? Well, if you haven't heard of this before, you haven't run into this, this is actually something Chrysler has dealt with um, on a lot of this era of vehicles. I've seen it on the Dodge trucks. I've seen it on the Chargers and Chrysler 300s, on the Jeeps. They have direct control over these coils, which means there's two wires coming from the PCM controls, all the current going to each ignition coil. There is no separate module. There's no transistor within the coil. It's all handled by the PCM. So what that means is the PCM is susceptible to a coil actually spiking it and basically causing the PCM to reset briefly, to shut it down. And I guess I don't really know all the technical details on what's happening, but take a look at the scope pattern and you can see a little bit about what I'm talking about. And I've run into this before on Dodge trucks, on Jeeps, on Chrysler 300s, where a coil at a random interval will spike the PCM, shut it down, and then the PCM comes back to life and like nothing ever happened. No codes are set, nothing happens. And the fix is to replace the coil, sometimes the plug as well. And so how do I prove this? Uh, there's a couple different ways I can do this. Now I could either move the coil and see if it happens. You know, if I, if I move that coil to number three and I look, does the dropout happen at the same point? Does the dropout now happen after the number three coil firing after I moved it? That's an option, but I got to pull the intake. The other thing I can do is unplug that coil and just run this thing and see, does it stall? And I unplugged it and I ran it for about 45 minutes and I didn't get a stall. I plugged the coil back in and I shortly after got a stall again at the same point after the number five coil firing. So what do we got to do? We got to replace that brand new ignition coil that's in number five as well. And so again, I tell them like, you guys are going to love this. <laughs> you need another new ignition coil for the new one that's in there. This is spiking the PCM. This is taking this thing out. Uh, now, do you take a look at the crank sensor signal? Because an argument could be made that this crank sensor needs to be replaced, but the glitch that happens in that crank signal, I have a feeling it's because of what's happening with the PCM. Maybe the five volt reference circuit is not working properly. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, but what I do know is if that was a bad spot in the sensor in the reluctor or something like that, you'd expect to see it every revolution of the crank. And we only see it we only see it randomly and we only see it immediately after this coil firing. And that's only once every 720. So again, argument could be made for this crank sensor. But what I do know is once they replace this coil, I call, I call them back up a few days later because I didn't hear anything. And sometimes as a mobile tech, uh, that might not be good news if you don't hear anything, but it also might be good news that they moved on with their life. And they said it was great. They put a new coil, they drove it around for a long time, never got any stalling. So they sent it down the road. So what was the original problem with this thing <laughs> that shops were trying to fix? I don't know. Maybe it was coils, plugs, O2 sensors. I have no idea. They fixed it along the way, but they created new problems with brand new parts. Now these coils were aftermarket. So, you know, no big surprise there. And the O2 sensors were obviously the wrong one for, for the car, but just think about how that makes diagnosing something different. Well, we've already replaced the coils. We've already replaced the O2 sensors. There's got to be something else going on here. It's got to be a computer or a wire or an update to the module or something like that when really we just 
need to go back to understanding how a system works and doing our tests, trusting our tools, trusting our tests, trusting our understanding of these systems and our experience and we can get through it. And of course, that's that's what it's all about, training, going to classes, watching videos so that you're prepared uh, for things like this. That can be very challenging. But again, um, go to the Facebook page to check out the waveforms because it was kind of cool to see uh, that that coil event happening and then the PCM essentially shutting down for a brief period of time. Very interesting and uh, that's the first time I'd actually saved the scope capture for this happening. That's about it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm looking to uh, get some guests on the show in the near future, so be sure to check out the next episode. Otherwise, let's get out there and start fixing the world one car at a time.